And we just have to understand that we are living in absolute fraud. And it's because we've allowed other people to tell our story. Yes. And, and so I've dedicated my life to studying our history and our culture. And I guess that's why Tariq Nasheed reached out to me with the Hidden Colors series was to begin. Because he had seen my work on YouTube. Because uh, um, I never put anything up on YouTube. Everything that you see on YouTube, somebody else put out. You don't put any of it. No, no. Because I've always tried to stay quiet, man. Mm. Uh, you know, I've always tried. Dr. John Henry Clark, who I consider to be my teacher, used to always tell me, Booker T, black people can do anything they want as long as they don't run out in the street and tell people what they're doing. Hey, that's very true. And, I, and, and he used to always tell me, yeah. the more popular you become, the more power you lose. Mm. And so I've always tried to stay behind the scenes, but Hidden Colors brought me front and center to the community. It, 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 it exposed me to people that had never known my work. And then they Google my name, they go to YouTube, and they see all these things that came down. And then they start to see, well, no, this brother been around. I've had people tell me, yo, man, I saw your son, man. He was doing a dynamic presentation. No, that was me 30 years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> on DVD that had been converted to, uh, on, on, on um, VHS. VHS, video cassette that has been converted to DVD. Digitally, yeah. Things I did 30 years ago, man. I'm, you know, I mean, you know, I've been doing this work for a while and doing presentations. And man, they got me up on the corner of 125th Street talking to people. Yeah. You know, on YouTube. Because that's how I used to roll. But with Hidden Colors, it brought me front and center. What was the Hidden Colors experience like for you? Well, for me, it was interesting because I'm the only one that's been in every one of them. Mm -hmm. And it started back in, um, in 2010. I got a call from a brother, Ola, who is Tariq's right hand. And he said to me, um, you know, we're doing a documentary and we'd like to know if you'd like to be a part of it. I have a colleague, uh, Tariq Nasheed, he's in Los Angeles. He'd, he'd like to know if you want to be a part of it. And I said, yeah, sure. This was in the spring of uh, 2010. So I was teaching a course in Harlem and I decided that that would be the best place for the studio, uh, for, for them to come film me. And... Um, so I invited them to come. It was in December of 2010. And they came up with their uh, film crew. Tariq was there. And uh, that's the first time I ever met him. And, you know, he started asking questions. And so when you're looking at Hidden Colors 1, that's my classroom mm. that I'm in. And so that's, that was Hidden Colors 1. Okay. Um, they contact me and tell me it's premiering in New York in April. I said, well, that's interesting. Because I was doing a presentation, I ran a little late. But I got to the movie house on 12th and Broadway. And, man, when I walked in for the first time, I, the place was standing room only. I thought I was in the wrong movie house until I saw my big head up on that screen. Man, I never saw my head so big in my life, man. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was, it was a, in a movie, man. I said, my, I never knew that Hidden Colors was going to be that because I've done things, man, f for folk. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, I've never thought of the repercussions. People say, man, we really would like to film you. Like what you and I did when we met up in Jacobs. You know, you say, come on, man, I'd like to do something. Yeah, okay, fine. You know, let's see if we can arrange the time to come and do it. Yeah. And so that's, what I, that's how I've always done it. Uh, folk were doing something, sure. And so I never knew that would turn out to become what it became. And so um, a year later, got a call. Tariq's interested in doing Hidden Colors 2. You know, and I'm saying, wow, you know, that's a lot, that's bold, you know. Hidden Colors 1 was a great success, man. To, to do a 2, you better be confident in your stuff. This was the one on melanin. Yes. So I said, sure. I'm down, but, you know, it better be good because you got to follow up on one. And, you know, a lot of times when you, when you have others that come after, it's not always like the first one. Never. You know, it's not always like the first one. But the second one was more powerful than the first one. A year and a half later, I get a call. Tell Rick, want to do number three. I say, okay, man, I'll do it. You're pushing it, but I'm going to do it, you know. And that was the one on the rules of racism. Yeah. Okay big. And all this time I'm getting more calls to come out and do presentations. Things are changing. For all of the people in the Hidden Color series, it's bringing us front and center to the community, particularly to young people. Mm -hmm. 
I developed a study guide. It's up on my website now, kabakamane.com. Free. Because it came out of Hidden Colors because so many people wanted information. They say, oh man, can you give me a book? And like, yeah, okay, I can give you a book, man, but that's not going to do it. I, I have to give you a lot more than that. So I created, I brought all my work together. I put it in outline form and I, and I put it up on my site. So that anyone that wants to go www.kabakamane.com, you'll get my free e-course and my study guide for free. That is my most precious gift. And that's why I did it for free. Because I believe that our community needs to come someplace and I can't make it a financial gain for me. So my study guide is my gift to our community. It's free. You want this information? You want to know how to study the African presence in America, the African presence in Asia, the African presence in Europe, the origins of life in Africa. If you want to study it from its deepest perspective, I've got all the books listed there. I've even got the pages per particular chapter that you need to read for a particular theme. So it's all there for the community. It's free. Because I believe that the greatest gift that you have should be free. Everything else you can charge. Because mm. this is an economic venture too. Mm. Because a poor revolutionary leads a poor revolution. And we better never forget that. Freedom ain't free. And for some reason, many of us don't mind paying for Kevin Hart, which I agree with. Because people making money on Kevin Hart, and Kevin Hart deserves to make the money. But if you're willing to pay that to laugh, what do you pay for your freedom? So there has to be some type of economic reciprocity here. But the most important thing that I have is free. And it becomes important that when you go to my site, you can see all of the work that I've done over the years that you can then get in terms of the topics that you're interested in. And it's all up there, you know. After Hidden Colors 3, okay, a year and a half later, I get a call. He interested in the religion of white supremacy. I say, okay. <laughs> See, my wife has been on this road with me all my life, man. We hang out, we just do things. So she's watched this over the years. She's been there for the whole ride. The whole ride, the pre-ride, man, <laughs> pre-ride. Before I even had a ride, she was there. <laughs> that's that, you know. That's how I know she with me because she was with me when I didn't even have a job, man. So I know, you know. <laughs> Let me ask but, you this question because I see this a lot with younger folks and even my age. I'm 41 and down. A lot of people from my generation or younger aren't in relationships. Can you give them? any relationship advice. I don't even think they know how to have mm. relationships. Commitment. Oh. Okay. Commitment. But what happened to my generation? What did the fathers do to them? Did their fathers show commitment to mother? I don't blame the young people. They were born into this. For, you know, for some reason, we, the adult population, the elders, did not show commitment. See, it's not the relationship. They got relationship. The problem is they got too many relationships, but no commitment. They don't understand commitment. I'm not happy with you no more. But who the hell cares about your happiness? If you have children, you have a commitment to those children. And nations, see, some people want to build nations. Some people say empires. I want to build dynasties. Dynasties are built on families. You know, you can build a nation built on people. But if you can walk away from your loved one, you can walk away from the nation. You can walk away from an uh, uh, empire, but you can't walk away from a dynasty because your entire existence is right up inside that family. And if your family ain't tight, you ain't tight. That's why I always ask people, how your family? If I ask you how you doing, you say, oh, I'm doing fine. How your family? Oh man, we got some problems. No, no. If your family got problems, you got problems. Don't tell me you fine if your family got problems. In fact, you could be having it very rough and your family all right, then you all right. See, that's an African tradition that we've lost, which is commitment. That's why we could meet the person we were going to marry the day that we were going to marry them the so-called arranged marriage, because marriages were about families coming together. They weren't so much about two individuals, I'm, I'm in love. Yeah, I'm in love. What the? In love? No, you weren't in love. Because love hurts. 
See, we use that word love too much. That's why I don't like to use it. I don't use love. Because love is when you want to walk away for your own personal reasons, but you don't because it's something larger than you. Because once you get into a commitment, your words, I, me, and mine, change into we, us, and ours. And this generation has watched the elder generation lose their commitment to their cause. So my message to young people is to understand, like when they say to me when there's a wedding and they ask me to say something to the bride and groom, I always say, look, y'all didn't get married because y'all in love. Y'all got married because you infatuated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're waiting for that call to come and you just wait by the phone and your stomach gets all queasy and then you start checking the dial tone to make sure the phone is working, you know, so they can get through to you. Okay, that's infatuation. That's not love. Love is when you want to walk away, but you don't because there's something larger than just your own personal desires. And that's what built the pyramids. That's what built Africa was commitment. Not just between people, but to issues, to causes, to family, to your neighbor. That's what built the great things. That's why the dynasties were families that ruled. And they handed down the legacy to the family. And the people said, hey, nobody better than so-and-so's son, since so-and-so did so good. So-and-so's son living around that must be able to take on. It wasn't about a, a dictatorship. It was about just simple common sense. Mm. You know, and, and this is some of the things that I think when we get into our culture and our history, and one of the reasons why I wrote Spirituality Before Religions was to go deeper inside of us as a people to understand spirituality. Not as a religion, not just as an esoteric. That's why the subtitle of my book is Spirituality is Unseen Science and Science is Seen Spirituality. Because that was the point that I was trying to push with us. That there is the seen and there is the unseen. And our ancestors understood. They could see the seen, but they would never see the unseen. And people say, oh man, I saw the unseen. No, you didn't see the unseen. You just didn't see it before. <laughs> so you think it was unseen. You're not going to see the unseen. That's why it's called the unseen. And our ancestors understood this. And when they embraced their consciousness around these ideas, they developed a systematic way of living that allowed them to produce the greatness that they produced. And everywhere that you see Africans being defeated in Kemet or in Egypt, you see a downcline in the society because other cultures come in. Then you see the raising of the civilization in the Middle Kingdom because the Africans from the South came up and conquered those Asians that came in. And then you see it down again and that's because the Asians came in and ran the Kushites out. And then all of a sudden you see a rise in the New Kingdom because Africans from the South came in and pushed down the Asians. Everywhere that you see Africans in place you see success and the moment they take over you know, Western civilization has been devolving since the Moors were thrown out of Europe in 1492. But because we're experiencing European history, we get the impression that there's been an upgrowth in, in civilization. There hasn't been an upgrowth in civilization. In fact, we've devolved. Just look at the conditions that we're living in today. Yeah, I tell people, you know, you say, well, what's your proof? <laughs> look around. <laughs> look at what's happening. We don't trust nobody. We don't care for nobody, there's no commitment. Uh, lie, steal, and cheat, tolerate those that do. That's where we're living right now, and it's a hustle, okay? And if I can hustle you and get something out of you, then hey, that all, you know, all that's cool. And that's what we're living now. But in Africa, your word was your bond. I, I, I do a, a Comedic Wisdom School online class, and I just completed this series on West Africa. And there are quotes from ancient travelers that go into places in, in Nigeria and in Ghana and in Benin. And they say, it is safe here. The society looks down upon crime and you will pay a price for crime. You can leave your, 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 your expensive worth. You don't have to worry about anybody taking it. You can walk the streets and not be worried about being accosted. Imagine what it's like to live in a safe environment like that. You know, imagine if we could live in a safe environment where we knew our children were safe, our, our family was safe, 
uh, that we could depend on the word of the person we were talking to, that we wouldn't have to worry. Think about the kind of society you could create if you didn't have to worry about all those other things that pull you down ne in negativity. That's what Africa was. Okay, and now look at where we are now. That's how I know that what we're experiencing isn't an African thing. Because if you go back to Africa, it ain't happening back there. And it just becomes very important for us to understand, to know our history. And that's what I'm trying to, trying to develop for our community to just, don't believe me. I, I'm not doing this for you to believe me. I'm doing this to make you think. And if I can make you think, then I'm being successful. Yes, Hotep family, you know, I, you know, I encourage you to uh, uh, look to Amazon for my uh, new book. It's my second book, Spirituality Before Religions. And uh, it, it explores spirituality before religions existed. And it um, goes from the very beginning of time, even before the beginning began, until what we're experiencing today. So I encourage you to go to Amazon and download Spirituality Before Religions.